Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer, and this is Super House. About six and a half years ago, I surgically implanted an RFID microchip inside my left arm. And one of the reasons I did that was so that I could use my arm to unlock doors and um, not have to carry keys around. I want to be able to just walk up to a door, put my arm near the reader, have the door recognize me and be unlocked. So today I'm going to show you a bit about how you can achieve that. Not necessarily with an implant, you don't have to go to that extreme, but just with an RFID tag that you could have on your key ring or carry around in your wallet or purse, or even put on a piece of jewelry like on a wristband, or like attach it to your watch strap. And when the new home office was built, the builders fitted it out with all standard hardware. As you can see, the lock set on this particular door, this is the door to my home office um, workshop, is just a regular lock. It's got a key fitting on it and um, a little privacy snib, but there's nothing smart about it at all. So what I'm going to do in this episode is show you how I'm going to retrofit this lock for integration with my home automation system and also connect it up to an RFID reader so that I can control the locks either from touch screens around the house, from my phone, uh, or from a reader so I can just walk up to the outside of this office door, put my arm near it, it'll recognize me and let me in. So let's have a look at what the options are for retrofitting electromechanical control to locks. Here on my bench you can see three different examples of lock mechanisms. First we have the standard lock mechanism. This is actually what's inside the door right now. Uh, and a strike plate. So obviously what happens is when the handle is turned it rotates and it retracts the bolt so the door can open. The bolt itself slides across the strike plate and clicks into place and that's how it latches. So the strike plate itself is fitted to the frame and the bolt is fitted to the door. Now one way you can convert this over to electromagnetic operation is to leave the door mechanism itself exactly the same. So you have the sanded lock which has a key and a handle and you take the strike plate out of the frame and replace it with what's called an electric strike. Now this operates in the same way as a standard strike plate but it can be released electronically. A standard strike plate obviously is solid so the only way to open the door is to retract the bolt and allow it to slide across. With an electric strike plate by applying power to it this little gate can open up and the bolt can then open, can move across without having to be retracted. And this is what I've done so far in most doors that I've converted. I've used one of these electric strike plates mounted in the frame which can be triggered by the home automation system and when it's triggered this gate opens, the door opens and everything's good. However, um, what I'm going to do for this particular door is something I haven't done before. I'm going to use one of these commercial electric lock sets. Rather than having an electric strike plate, these use a standard static strike plate, but they have a servo controlled mechanism within the lock itself. This particular lock set I got as a clearance item from Bunnings. It cost about $269, so it's about double the cost of a standard um, lock set but it has a remote control. Now I've never fitted one of these before and I'm going to have to modify it so that I can integrate it with my home automation system. This is going to be entering the unknown. So let's open this one up and have a look. Oh and the other thing I should mention is another option for control of a door is an electromagnetic lock. With an electromagnetic lock you have a big metal plate attached to either, typically to the door and on the frame you have an electromagnet. So when the door closes, the electromagnet grasps the plate which is attached to the door. Um, I've set that up on a door at my office, but I don't have an example here to show you. Uh, but that's another way you can control the door. That totally bypasses the issue of the lock itself because it's something that attaches to the door and the frame, independent of the handle and anything else. Now that I've unboxed the Lockwood Nexian keyless entry set, this is what I've got. There are the two handles, so there is the external handle that just has mechanical action on it. Uh, there is the key here as well, so you can unlock it from the outside using a regular key. The internal mechanism, which includes a battery pack, there is a little motor in here to lock and unlock it. 
there are indicator LEDs on both the inside and the outside and um, a latch so you can change modes manually and of course the key from the inside as well so you can deadlock it. It's got the two remote controls so you can use these to lock or unlock the door. According to the manual it says these work up to about three meters away so you have to be quite close for those to work. There is the strike plate as I said that's just a static strike plate so um, there's nothing complicated there. More fittings for the strike plate this is the, um, the main lock mechanism. So this is what hooks into the strike plate. And these little plastic covers are to fill in existing holes. One of the differences between this and a regular lock mechanism, typically with a front door lock mechanism, what happens is there is the handle that runs through at this height and then the bolt is a little bit lower. It'll typically be around here. With this particular system, the bolt is in line with the handles, so it has to be mounted in a different place in the door. So you need to fill in both the hole in the door itself, where the old bolt came out, and the hole in the frame of the, um, the door, where the old strike plate mounts. So this comes with a couple of plastic covers that you can use to fill in those holes and make it look neater. And now I've put the batteries in, so let's see this in action. This lock is now fully powered up, batteries are in place and the mechanism should be fully functional. So if I press the unlock button with this little remote control, let's see what happens. Well, you can see that it's gone to the unlock position. It delays about six seconds and then it returns to the locked position. And obviously it gives us audible enunciation and the LED flashed on there as well. Now if I had plugged these two together, which is the case once it's all mounted, the status LED would have illuminated on this one as well. And it also has a lock button, so we can explicitly lock it. So it's now in locked mode. And then I can unlock it again. So the first major step in this conversion is to remove the old lock mechanism. So I'll do that now. There we go, piece of cake. So now we have the door all empty, ready to fit up for the new lock mechanism. Now in this case, I'm retrofitting to what's called a key in knob mechanism, where there is a hole through here and another hole through here for the lock mechanism itself, plus the standard four mounting holes. So I'm going to use the measurements that are provided for the um, key in knob retrofit. And here we go, just got to put the battery cover back on. That's it. And the mechanism is now fitted to the door. I haven't put the strike plate on yet, but let's test this. At the moment I can open it from the inside, I can open it from the outside. It's in the green position. I can put it in yellow, can't open it from the outside, but I can from the inside. So now I have this electronic remote control lock set fully installed and functional as the maker intended. With the remote control, I can now lock it. So I can't open the door. I can unlock it. And now it works. But how is this to be tied into the home automation system? It's not intended for networking. Well, the answer is right here in the remote control. This is the remote control for the Nexian keyless lock. Now one trick that I've done so many times that I've lost count is take remote controls, open them up and modify them by connecting read relays or similar across the back of the buttons so they can be controlled by an Arduino. That allows us to take control of whatever the remote device is as if we've pressed the buttons on the remote. In the case of this device that's pretty much necessary, it's about the only way we can do it because it uses a rolling key code um, authentication system I can't just make a transmitter that operates at the same frequency and send the unlock code. I really need something with the correct chip in it that is going to be identified by the lock 
and that will um, open on demand. So let's start by pulling this remote control apart and I'm pretty sure I know what I'm going to find in here. Just about every one of these sorts of things I've ever pulled apart has got either little tacked switches inside or a membrane keyboard, something like that. And they're usually remarkably simple. So we'll get it open, it's got a rubber cover. And yes, what do you know, it's got a couple of button cells and these little uh, buttons, sort of like membrane buttons. It's a tensioned piece of metal that is arched up away from the surface of the PCB and when that is pushed in, oh, the lock just locked over there, um, it sends a signal. So th these are just two push buttons. So by connecting across the back of these, we can take control of this remote control. You can see on there all of the parts. What I'm going to use to actually control this is probably something like this. This is an Ether Mega, which is an Arduino compatible board with built-in Ethernet. And I'll also use a power over Ethernet regulator that'll need to be soldered in place on here. I'm using power over Ethernet to run devices, all the network nodes around the place. What I can do is combine that with a prototyping shield, which gives me a place to put extra parts on. I'll put on a couple of read relays. These are tiny 5 volt relays that the Ether Mega can switch on demand and they can short across the back of the buttons. So by activating the relays we can essentially simulate pressing the buttons on the remote. And I'll also put on a DS18B20 temperature sensor. Not necessarily because I care about temperature where this is going to be mounted, but just because I'll use my little trick of taking the identifying address of the temperature sensor using that as the MAC address on the network for the, net the Ethernet interface on the board. So it's time to put this together. Let's see how it turns out. I'm making a little bit of progress now. I have the EtherMega with the power over Ethernet regulator mounted on it. That's all soldered in place. Because that sticks up, I had to cut a notch out of the prototyping shield. And I fitted a header which is going to go to a serial interface. In fact, all of this could have been done with a regular Ether 10 or a normal Arduino. The reason I'm using the EtherMega is that I wanted the extra serial I.O because I need this to communicate with RFID and other things. This control unit is now pretty much together. I've got the read relays connected up. They're connected to digital outputs 2 and 3 and I've put markers on here. So a couple of years down the track when I'm trying to figure this out I don't have to trace the circuit. I've got headers so I can plug in a little wiring loom that will go to the remote control and I have the DS18B20 temperature sensor which is connected to D8 so that I can set the MAC address automatically got the power of Ethernet regulator pretty much ready to go but um, just before I wire up the little loom to connect it up to the remote control I chucked this under the microscope had a look at it and discovered some interesting things the chip that drives it here is a microchip HCS301 which is a, um, a code hopping encoder um, as I mentioned before it uses a different code each time that it transmits which means I can't just send a, um, a signal, like replicate the signal from the transmitter. I have to use a proper transmitter that is paired to the receiver. And the interesting thing is, well a couple of them, one is that this chip is designed to operate on anything from 3.5 to 13 volts and the batteries that were included were was a pair of 3 volt batteries so it's running nominally at 6 volts. Given the wide voltage range that it supports, I think what I'll do is I'll connect this directly to 5 volts on the Arduino that way I don't need the batteries anymore and um, the other thing is that this encoder has four inputs and um, there are only two of them that are wired up so there are two buttons on the remote control and presumably if we activate the other two inputs then we get different codes coming out of it of course the receiver probably doesn't know what to do with them in fact you can have up to 15 inputs by multiplexing these inputs so if you use a little diode array and you assert two of them together then um, you can get a binary output so um, well it's a binary input which gives you a different code output so you can have 15 input buttons on a keypad connected to this little encoder chip and um, use just these four inputs which is quite cool so what I'm going to do now is make up a little wiring loom that connects to this 
It's going to connect to power supply and ground, or VCC and ground obviously, to supply power. And also connect to the first two inputs to emulate pressing those buttons. I added another header onto the shield. This is to provide power, given that I'm not going to use the batteries anymore. And um, I soldered the connections for the little encoder chip directly onto the pins of the chip. I had to do that under the microscope because it's pretty small. Uh, but I think that's it for the hardware. So we're ready to rock and roll. All I need to do now is write the software that will connect to the network. And um, I'm going to have this connect to an MQTT server. And then when certain events happen, it'll trigger the outputs, which will send the code via the transmitter to lock and unlock the door. So now I've got to spend some time writing some code. Now the software to run on the Arduino is all done. You can see here that it's plugged into Ethernet. It's being powered using power over Ethernet. There's no other power connection. But as you can see from the power LED, it's all up and running. It's using the DS80MB20 to identify itself, setting the MAC address on the network and I've got the remote control here ready to plug into it. I don't actually have it plugged in just now. What this is doing is presenting a web interface. It's using a library on the Arduino that allows it to um, serve up a web page. And because this is connected to the network, what my home automation controller can do now is make HTTP calls into the interface on this and it will then in turn toggle these outputs. So we can send a command as a web connection saying toggle output D2 or toggle output D3 and it will then send that output. So any of the devices around the house now that uh, pull up the web interface can do that. So what I've done is on the generic web interface I've added office door as an option. So if I touch the office door button you'll see that the D3 output toggles and if I press the red one which is a lock button you'll see that the D2 output toggles. So we're ready now to hook this up to the door. And at last we're ready to go. We have the lock in place, we have the remote control connected, and it's all linked to the home automation system. So now the home automation system has control over the lock. I can unlock it from my phone, or lock it, and I can unlock it. What that means is that we can use a variety of inputs. At the moment I'm just using the web interface on my phone. It could be done from a control panel, could be done from an RFID reader. Uh, now I do want to show you the RFID stuff but this episode has taken a little bit longer than I expected so I'm going to hold that over and do a whole episode on RFID because that's some pretty cool stuff. See you next time.